first reading this morning is from Jonah, third chapter, first through the fifth verse, and then to the tenth. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city, and it took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the Lord saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. The word of the Lord. The second one <coughs> is from 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter, starting with the 29th verse. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live like they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it was not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. How can he please the Lord? But a married man is concerned about the affairs of the world. How can he please his wife? And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affair. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world. How can she please her husband? I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in the right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. The word of the Lord. The calling of the first disciples. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting an net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nests and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, and James son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Our gospel this morning was Mark's record of Jesus and his first disciples. Mark is always direct and to the point. He tells sometimes the highlights of the story. But that's why the gospels are so interesting. We see the same story from different eyes. It's like in real life. Say the story is about two brothers building their house. One brother will tell you the story from the bottom up. How the foundation was poured, the supplies used, how it was put together. Who did each part? The other brother will tell you the story from the top down. He'll say, your house is built, it's done. Now, both brothers are telling the same story about the same house. And they're both exactly correct. But one gives a little more fine detail than the other does. See, Luke is our gospel writer that gives details. I want to share his version of this same story that I just read from Mark. Luke chapter 5, 1 through 11. One day Jesus was standing by the lake of Gesenera, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee. The people were crying around him, listening to the word. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen, who were washing their nets. 
He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put it out a little farther from shore. Then he sat down and talked to people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Because, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they called and filled both boats. They came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, from now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. You see the difference there? They both told the same story. Mark said, Jesus said, let's go. Then Luke tells a little bit more. So I'll look into the, the Luke version a little bit. Let's talk about the large crowds first. Now, Jesus had to get into a boat and go away from the shore a little bit so all the people could see him and hear him. Jesus was speaking of God. I, I read that and I think, what a great testimony of the need of the people. They were looking for answers. They were looking for a different answer in their lives. See, Jesus had the answers they needed. They were hungry for the truth. And they were ready to be taught. Now, you notice I didn't say they were ready to be caught. As goes my best story's title today, Fishing for People. Because as we read in our Bibles, we see that many of the people turned against Jesus in the very near future. But we don't know how many of the, if this group exactly was in the courtyard. Remember that courtyard when the people were chanting, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus? So we don't know how many of these people that were on that shore listening had changed their hearts and went the other way. But at this moment in their life, Jesus had the right lure, if you will, to get them to look. He got their interest up. See, it's truly like fishing. It's truly like fishing. You have to get the interest of the fish, don't you? <clears throat> See, if you don't get that fish's interest, it's not going to commit to your hook. That's the difference between catching something and just, well, teaching something. See, in our churches today, there are some churches that seem to have the right lure to draw people in, don't they? When a good one's found, there seems to be a feeding frenzy around that church, doesn't it? But as we've seen in our Bible so many places, when the feeding frenzy's over, the people seem to move on. They go looking for something different again. So the question that we have to work with in our churches and our society today is, how do we keep their interest? How do we get those people of today committed to the Word of God? How do we take them from being taught to being caught? Because our job here is not to catch them, but to teach them. Our job here is to make them want to find out what it is, and the Holy Spirit will catch them. But like so many, I don't, I don't know the answer. I'm not sure what to do in today's society. 
I mean, now when I'm truly fishing, you know, I've tried it many times. I try different things. I go in my tackle box and I pull out that secret weapon. And then too often, it doesn't work either. So there I sit, kind of downhearted. And I usually go home. That's what I do. But here in the church, I don't give up that easy. I don't want to give up that easy. But the question is, what do we do here in the church? What is our lure to get people to God? Well, it's pretty simple. The only lure that we have in our tackle box is the true word of God. We have to hold tight, tight to our true faith. See, when we start using things that aren't right, we'll take our catch straight to hell. I hope people understand that. If we teach the wrong thing just to get him in, we're going to take him down a path that isn't good. So where do we go for that sure-fired method of being what Jesus wants us to be? Fishers of people. When people won't bite As I said, you know, we can't give everything exactly what they want. If it's against God's word, we're lo truly losing anyway. So again, what do we do? Well, it's in the words of the last verse. Verse 11. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Catch that? They left everything and followed him. That's the lesson of this morning's teaching. We had to learn to leave our plans behind and look to Jesus' lead. We have to get out of our boat. I think Jesus used that term a couple of times in our Bible, didn't he? Getting out of the boat and coming to him. I think it was with Peter. See, that's Jesus' surefire remedy to get people to follow him. Is to have us follow him too. And then they'll follow him. No. I love this story for one of the things that always gets me about his disciples. None of these guys were preachers. None of them were public personalities. Up until now, they were stinky fishermen. Think about it. They were the kind of the people in society that, well, they're just over there working and nobody cares about. Them. But now they were going to learn from Jesus. They were going to be Jesus' first fishermen of people. They left everything behind that they were sure of and followed Jesus. They got out of their boats. They said, well, we're not fishermen no more. We're disciples. We're going to be apostles. Well, like I told the kids Wednesday night, the difference between a disciple and apostle. A disciple is one who follows and listens. An apostle is the one who has taken the step to be a teacher. Wednesday night, they were the disciples. I'm the apostle. Jesus is still Lord. But I'm trying to teach them. And one of these days, they're going to be the apostles. Because they're going to be teaching the disciples behind them. But we have to follow Jesus' word, his lead, or we don't know what to do. Now, I know in today's churches, we get nervous. Don't we? When we're not able to draw people. Not seeing our numbers grow. Sounds fair, doesn't it? We get nervous, that's what we do, that's what humans do. We feel just like Simon in verse 4, in the first part of verse 5. That's the glory of this teaching, it's, it tells us what's going on. Verse 4, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And here's us. 
Simon answered, Master, we've worked all hard all night, and we haven't caught anything. That's just the way it feels, doesn't it? We've worked hard, and we haven't caught anything. We've worked so hard to get people to come, and we've been without a catch now. And honestly, for three years. But we need to stay the course, and Simon, just like Simon, we need to say the last half of the verse five. We have to say that last half over and over. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. We gotta tell God, I will not stop, I will not give up, we will just keep going. Because the time to catch people is not our decision. God has a plan if we listen. Think of that. Simon and Peter, or Simon and Peter and John and all those boys, they had worked all night long and not caught anything. Their plan was done. They, they'd done what they thought. But God had a plan for them. I'm going to have you catch fish right now when you don't think you can. That's the glory of this story. When they, did, they thought it was done, they were all over with it, and there was no sense in going out again. Jesus said, follow me. I'll show you how to do this. No. we got to give up our human responses. You know the one that says, we need people, we got to grow. we got to be somebody. But you know what? God put on my heart, and he's put this on my heart many, many times when I'm in my office praying, Lord, why don't we fill these pews? And he's put on my heart several times. Mr. Crone, this church wasn't put here to be a church of many people. It was put here to be a church of people who are believers in God. You see the difference there? We see all around us churches that have set our sights on big crowds that will do whatever it takes to make people happy, right? See, catching today's catch is a challenge, to say the least. But just to cause a feed frenzy is not the way to a true faith. Now, let's be honest. We've asked ourselves many times here, what should we do? Do we need to use a different lure? Do we need to try something different to draw people in? My answer to that as a pastor is like always, we have to pray on it. We have to pray on it. We have to get on our boat, trust Jesus, and follow him. And the hard part is we have to leave everything behind that we know. We have to follow him just like the disciples did. See, no matter what we do, we need to tell the people the truth of the Bible. We need to show them our commitment to God. And we need to be the believers in the power of Jesus Christ. So that last sentence is the one that, that I think sometimes all churches in this world are faltering at. Believing in the power of Jesus Christ. Because there's some great churches in the world that teach the true word. But they're not catching anybody either. But we have to believe in Jesus Christ. See, because he's the only one that can get other people interested. It's the Holy Spirit that opens hearts. It's the Holy Spirit that takes a heart of stone and makes it into a heart of flesh. No. If we have the faith of Simon, see, because he's not Peter, he's just Simon. If we have the faith of Simon and believe in the power of our Lord and Savior, he will fill this church up to more than we can handle. 
you get that? The boats were over full. This boat right here will be overflowing. And I think of something very, very profound, very different. But right now we have a lifeboat down on the south end. When this boat, this boat here gets over full, we'll just send them down to the other end and they can watch the same thing that we're watching. Do you see God's plans starting to fall into place? I do. But it's only when we give our plans to Jesus that he'll fill this boat, this church, this house, this everything. Like last week with Samuel and Nathaniel, when we hear that epiphany moment that Jesus is speaking to us, when we hear that moment where something comes to us, it doesn't sound right, but it sounds good. When we hear that, come and follow me, I've got the plan. And we say yes. And then he'll say, now do this. This is against your plans all together. You don't fish in the daytime, but I want you to go fishing. And I'm going to fill you up because you trust me. And as I said, that doesn't go for this church alone. We have 10 churches in town. Everyone should be overflowing with the number of people that live in this town. But churches have stayed in their boat too much. We don't need to change the word of God. We just need to change the way we present it. I don't know. But you know what? I'm going to keep praying. As your pastor, I'm going to keep saying, Lord, you are the captain. I'm just the first mate. You set the course. I'll talk to the crew. And we'll do what you ask us. And wow. Lord, You've already started building the ship bigger because your plans are coming. Let's trust him. Oh, let us pray. Under Heavenly Father, I can't help but get excited when I think about what you've been doing. What you've been doing at this, this church. Lord, you look at our last year. It was quiet. There were no fish. But just like the disciples, you're going to fill us up at a time that we don't expect it. This next year in our country is a year that people are going to need you. We tried a year of everything but you. We tried to find our, our guidance in places that had nothing to do with you. And it all failed. And it will continue to fail because it's not your plan. Lord, we read about Noah, or not Noah, but Jonah, I'm sorry. The city of Nineveh was three days long. We can't imagine walking through a city that takes three days. And little Jonah walks in a day's worth and preaches your word. Lord, he had his day with a fish. Now teach us what he learned. Oh, Lord, continue to bless this church. Continue to, continue to guide us in the plans that you have for us. Continue to give us the ability to just step out of the boat and walk on the water. And not sink like Peter did when he lost faith. Lord, I, I ask you to fill us up. That we're not, oh ye of little faith, but oh ye of my followers. Oh Lord, continue to guide us. We just pray this all in your holy name. Amen. Uh, let us let us pray for our people. Let us pray for all those in need. Oh, let us pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father. You are the creator of this world. You are the one that makes the plans. You are the one that, that watches over everything. Heavenly Father, you have been here 
forever. Help us to always remember that you are there, that you are, you are God. When our world gets us going so fast that we forget that you are in charge, help us to slow down and humble our hearts. Help us to look up and say, Lord, this is your world. Thank you for letting us live here. Oh dear God, you had a perfect plan for us. But with all plans, we mess up once in a while. Humankind sinned against you. We said we didn't have to trust you. But dear God, you said I will forgive you if you if you say you're sorry. I'll send my son to teach you how to say you're sorry. Because sometimes a sinful heart doesn't know how to humble itself. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your son to show us everything we needed to know about a humble heart. Dear Heavenly Father, continue to, to bless us Continue to shine your light on us. Continue to be our God. Oh, Heavenly Father, in your mercy. Yeah. Oh, dear Jesus, you came to teach us, to teach us a new and a better way, to teach us how to, how to work with our sin. Because unfortunately we can't control it sometimes and we have to work with it. We have to tame it. Lord Jesus, you humbled your heart in so many places when you were beaten and spit on. You humbled your heart. When they put you on a cross, you humbled your heart and said, Father, they know not what they do. Lord Jesus, help us to learn from you. Help us to learn every day in those moments that something seems to bother us that we don't have to prove our point. We just humble our hearts and give it to you and say, this is beyond me, Lord. On your heavenly Father, your Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of the Heavenly Father, continue to show us how to be fishers of men here at this church. Continue to show us that if we follow in your ways, that 12 turns into millions, but only by following your ways. Lord Jesus, as our song said, We should fear not, for you will pile us. Lord Jesus, Savior, pilot me. Lord Jesus, in your mercy. Oh, Holy Spirit, you are the one, as I said, that they can take a heart of stone and make it into a heart of flesh. Under your Holy Spirit, teach us here, living word, how to spread that news. Give us your plan, give us your courage, give us your ways to go out like those, those first disciples and become apostles. Help us to go out and teach others. Under your Holy Spirit, I can see the plan falling into place a piece at a time. Just like Noah and his ark, one piece at a time. Holy Spirit, give us the spirit to be the boat that will save me. But only through the word of Jesus Christ our Lord. Dear God, we just commend all those in our, in our hearts.
hearts and our minds, all those in our congregation that are, are dealing with illness, that are in that part of their journey that's hard. Holy Spirit, please go into their hearts and let them know that you are there, that Jesus is there, that at the end of the journey, there is light. And that light is our Savior. Oh God, we just give all these prayers to you, asking this in your Holy Son's name, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.